All right, it is time. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, again, I apologize for the technical problems this morning, but now we can see Shelly on camera and she can also share her screen, which is amazing, okay? So today we are super honored to have Shelly Brunswick, okay? Uh, Shelly is the COO of Space Foundation. She's the executive leader for the Center of Innovation and Education. And on top of that, has been selected as a diversity and inclusion officer slash role model 2020 by Women Tech Network. Okay, Shelly is passionate about advancing space technology innovation and collaboration. And today she'll be sharing with us how to leverage innovation and entrepreneurship in a vibrant space economy. Okay, so Shelly, I won't take any more of your time. Please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, and, may, and thank you to Ellen and the planning team for putting together a wonderful conference the last two days. It's been incredible. I, I got to meet some fantastic attendees yesterday during the networking session. Um, I've, I've listened to several of the other speakers, so congratulations on a spectacular event. I also thank all of the students who have come back to uh, catch the second time we're going to go ahead and give this uh, uh, webinar or discussion a, a, an opportunity. Obviously with technology, it has definitely changed our lives over COVID in, in good ways and uh, in negative ways, but today was one of those hiccups with technology. So I thank all of you for bearing with us and I'm so excited to join you. Uh, what I would like to share with you is a little bit about my journey. Um, as Matthew said, I am the Chief Operating Officer at the Space Foundation and a UN Space for Women uh, met, mentor, as well as uh, selected as the Women Tech Diversity and Inclusion Officer and Role Model of the Year. But my journey started uh, a little over 30 years ago. So I like to say I have three chapters of my story because you are also writing your journey. And the first part of it was I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force, and that allowed me to build my skill set. And I, can, I enlisted right out of high school. And worked during the day and went to school at night. I had the opportunity to um, work both, you know, be uh, living in Turkey and Germany. And then I was stationed right here at the Air Force Academy while I was enlisted. But while I was going to school at night, I finished my bachelor's degree and master's degree. And then I became an officer in the U.S. Air Force. And that started the second part of my journey. And as an officer in the Air Force, that's when I transitioned into the space sector and the aerospace sector. I know being in the Air Force, people think you're automatically in the space sector, but I did personnel before that. But when I specifically became an officer, I became a space project manager, and I was stationed at the Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles, where they purchase all the space um, applications. So ground stations, on orbit satellites, launch vehicles. So I learned a lot about the industry. And from there, I became a professor at Defense Acquisition University, where I taught about space acquisition and the space acquisition life cycle and the procurement process. And then, the, and then the next part or the last part of my journey in the Air Force was when I was stationed on Capitol Hill as a budget and appropriations liaison, securing the budget for the U.S. Air Force, as well as all their space programs and taking congressional staffers on trips to look at the space industrial base, um, both in the U.S. as well as uh, in, in some other parts of the world. So it was an exciting time. And that's where I really learned a lot about space. And space has also transitioned during those 30 years. And now at the Space Foundation is the third part of my journey. And that was coming to the Space Foundation and being a Chief Operating Officer. And that is where we really see space taking a different role. So when I started in the Air Force, you really had to be in a military service or working for a civilian government agency like NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, et cetera. Over those 30 years, you have now seen that space is really a commercialized marketplace with multiple players and lots of opportunities for entrepreneurship. And so I am going to bring up some slides to share a little bit about what is taking place in the space economy. So let's see if these will come up. Okay. So as we like to think at the Space Foundation, so many of you may not be familiar with the Space Foundation, but we believe that space today is for a better tomorrow. 
and we've been in business almost 40 years. So we started in the early 1980s when Air Force Space Command stood up in Colorado Springs, and that is why our headquarters is located here in Colorado Springs. However, we are a U.S. nonprofit that does business internationally. So we advocate for all space, civil, international. And we look at things across a different area. So we have space awareness, which is what I'm doing today. I'm talking to you about the great opportunities that are in the space economy and that we want you to consider that as a career option. We do space education. How are we creating that future workforce? K through 12 teaching, uh, teaching teachers, providing curriculum development. So again, we're creating that robust workforce that will fill the jobs of the future. And then we look at service to our space community. And that's for individuals that are in the space sector or entrepreneurs that might want to come into the space sector. And so we do a platform called Space Symposium 365 that runs all year long with multiple activities um, and, and real person activities as well as um, legacy uh, videos from our previous 37 years of space symposiums. And then we do have an in-person event that will take place this August here in Colorado Springs. So that tells you a little bit about uh, some of our activities. And then I'm really going to go into more of our Center for Innovation and Education because that's where the entrepreneurship and leveraging technology resides. And I think most of you are interested in that. So when we think about space, a lot of times think people think about launch vehicles, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Boeing, or they think about going to Mars or the moon. And those are definitely the space industry. But there's parts of the space industry that are everyday activities, using your cell phone, doing this online uh, interactive conference, uh, athletic shoes, you know, materials that were designed in the space economy are now being used in, in bettering Earth, life on Earth. Weather prediction, fire retardant clothing for firefighters came from space technology, mammogram technology, cataracts. So a lot of the technology you're using every day is part of the space economy and you are part of the space economy. You may not know it yet. I, I want to share when we think about the technology in the space industry, here's some of the technology you may be familiar with. Data analytics. Right now there's more information coming off of satellites than we can process. So data analytics and the ability to process that and, and connect it with artificial intelligence so that we could rapidly come to decisions, whether that's food, um, you know, predicting food uh yields in agricultural areas, rainfall, weather prediction, transportation activities. You can look at energy and energy storage solutions as we look to going to more of the EV, electrical vehicle, or other types of energy on Earth. That's also going to be the energy we can use as we travel to Mars and the moon and beyond. Healthcare, huge areas of opportunity. Telecommunications, you're probably very familiar with. AI, I said, cybersecurity and advanced manufacturing. So there's lots of opportunities. So as you're going through college, think about these are some areas you could be part of the space community. I always like to show this. So if you thought that last slide was interesting, here is the NASA Technology Transfer Office. So over the course of the space program, NASA has collected patents from technology they have discovered by our space program. And they are exactly in those areas I highlighted. Healthcare, agriculture, communications, energy and energy storage, transportation, and many, many more. So if you want to be an entrepreneur and you don't have your own idea, you can go to the te NASA Technology Transfer Office. You can also go ESA, the European Space Agency also has a technology transfer office. And I would imagine the Canadian Space Agency does as well. So as we look at this, we're looking at space at one time was you had to be in the military or a PhD or an astronaut. And now the way the space industry is, we need STEM and non-STEM workers. We need um, individuals that have high school diplomas that have certifications in data analytics and cybersecurity and, and manufacturing, as well as PhDs. And, and we also need a lot of business entrepreneurs, you know, individuals that are looking to take this technology and bring it to market. So we look at 
creating that lifelong learning starting in childhood where we want to create space inspired curriculum that highlights not just how great space is today or history the planets Apollo but real careers in the space sector and then you also have to consider as technology continues to come online jobs are going to continue to need to be upskilled and reskilled. So we say we all need to continue to be lifelong learners. And we really want to help bring those individuals in that are underrepresented in the space sector. So here in the U.S., that would be minorities and women and veterans. So I have talked a lot about the space economy, and you're probably saying, well, what are the opportunities and how big will this grow? Well, currently we see the global space economy is $424 billion. And we expect that is gonna grow one to three trillion by 2040. Uh, Bank of America came out in November and said they expect the global space economy to be 1.3 trillion by 2030. 80% of nations are now part of the space economy. So absolutely, you have the US and Canada on one side uh, with Canada arm on the ISS, but there are emerging space agencies now, emerging countries that are setting up space agencies and want space and innovation in their country. Here in the US, only 20% of the space economy is government. So NASA or the Air Force, 80% is that commercial segment. And salaries in the space industry are above average. So again, there's lots of opportunities for individuals to look across that entire workforce pipeline, all the different sectors that relate to the space industry and look at pursuing careers. This is a snapshot from our annual The Space Report where we talk about where those opportunities are and how currently that pie for the space economy is sliced. So as you can see in the purple, 48 billion in the US is about the government spending, but you can see the vast majority is commercial. And right now it's really in the commercial space products and services. So you can look a lot at GPS and other activities. And again, you can see over time, you can see how the space economy has continued to grow. So again, we want you to think about as the space economy continues to grow, there are great opportunities for you. We do see some challenges and we do see a workforce shortage. So even in the US and other countries, there are more job openings right now in the space sector and we are looking for individuals to fill them, but we don't have the individuals that may have the right skill set. So it's about that lifelong learning and reskilling and upskilling. And we also need to find individuals who haven't considered space as an opportunity. So we need to have them look at coming into the space economy. And then again, we need to excite people about wanting to be entrepreneurs and taking this technology and bringing it to market. So for those reasons, we launched our Center for Innovation and Education so that we can create workforce development and economic opportunity so all individuals can come into the space economy. So how do we do that? We partner, we look across again, that entire workforce pipeline, business, government, education, local governments and communities. And we look across the students, young leaders like yourself, entrepreneurs and professionals to come into the space sector. And we do that through a variety of, whether it's partnerships or sponsorships, grants, fundraising, endowments and donations. This is the part that's really helpful. How do you come into the space economy? So we look at it as a five-step workforce development roadmap. It's not really a step, it is a circle. Um, it's about creating awareness. And again, today is about that awareness. There are opportunities for you to be part of the space economy. It's then creating an access point into the space economy in a place that you're interested in, one of those technologies. It's about getting the right training. So already you're, you're doing a lot of the right training. So the next step might be, are you connecting? Are you connecting with um, organizations that are looking to further the areas of your interest? And then it's about mentorship. Can you find a mentor or a sponsor or a coach that helps guide you through this workforce development roadmap? So I shared, we're looking at today's workforce as well as that future workforce. This is a chart I kind of like to share that highlights how we operate at the Space Foundation. So think about yourself, you're on that gray dot and you're looking out saying, 
who is the target audience I want to reach? So in your case, you might say, I'm, I'm a small business or an entrepreneur, or I want to be a young leader. So you can then look at, that's the group I fall into. And then we look at what are the outcomes? You know, is it about networking? Is it career upskilling? Is it getting the right skills? And then we go to that outer circle that talks about the space foundation programs that we offer, or who do we partner to to offer programs. So as was mentioned um, by Matthew, I'm part of the UN, Women Tech Network, uh, World Business Angels Investment Forum. So we do partner with other organizations to again create that ability for individuals to not just learn about space but actually get into the space sector. And as I highlighted on the sides, you can see those 16 different sectors that the space industry is part of. The Internet of Things, manufacturing, energy, environment, fintech. So again, the aperture is open. We hope that you'll find your way into the space community. I do want to share one of our programs that you might be interested in, and that is our Space Commerce Entrepreneurship Program. So if you're thinking about, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I might not know how, one of the programs the Space Foundation did was we set up our Space Commerce Entrepreneurship Program. We initially partnered with the U.S. Department of Commerce, Minority Business Development Agency, so we could help launch small businesses or startup businesses into the space industry. And we looked at that creates jobs not only for that entrepreneur, but that entrepreneur creates other jobs, or does that entrepreneur create a new line of business into the space and aerospace sector? And so over the course of this time, we have reached out to 275 plus underserved uh, entrepreneurs and small business leaders. Uh, we collaborated with universities and incubators and accelerators ar ar around the U.S. initially, and now we're in talks with some other countries. And then we awarded scholarships to individuals um, that were ready to come to our annual space symposium and network with the global space community. And in 2019, our global uh, space symposium had over 15,000 participants from almost every state in the United States, as well as a uh, multitude of uh, international participation. But if this is something you're interested in, we do have on our website free webinars that you can watch that talks about what is the space economy, how do I enter it, how do I strategize, and so those are some things that I would recommend you could look at if you're thinking I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, the other program we have is for high school students, and again, we have a lot of programs, but this one again relates to that entrepreneurship program, inspiring kids that are still in high school to look at the ability of what is it to go to plan a mission and work to develop um, a, a mission to go to Mars and then return safely, but also then set up a company and do a technology transfer from technology we learned on that mission to commercialize it and create a business plan. So we do that as well with teachers and we do that here in the US and we are also partnered with um, organizations internationally to do that. We shared how do you connect? You need to look for organizations where you connect. Women in Aerospace, there is a chapter in Canada. You have the UN Space for Women Network, but there's also Space Generation Advisory Council, so that is open to men and women So, uh, as well. Again, um, I shared with Matthew that for those of you who are interested in our Space Symposium 365, there is a registration fee, but please reach out and we'll be happy to talk to you about how we can help you find a way into that program so you can learn more about the space industry and ways for you to partner. So I'm going to close this um, and see if we can kind of do a little Q&A. And so Matthew, if you're back, I don't know if you had a few questions come in, but I, I hope that gave you some insight into the opportunities in the space sector that you are already in the space industry, you just might not know it, and now it's deciding where is your passion and how do you want to go? So over to you, Matthew. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much, Shelly. I loved your talk. And uh, to anyone who wants to ask Shelly some questions, okay, just drop them in the chat. I will ask her the question. Or even if you want to, you can uh, come on on video, turn on your mic and ask her directly, all right? So Shelly, uh, I do have a question for you, okay? it's. Um, so what advice would you give to our university students who most of them are in first year or second year if they wanted to get involved? Excellent. What I would recommend is depending 
what sector you're interested in, you should look for opportunities to connect into that. So one of the ones I recommend for many of your students is the Space Generation Advisory Council. So that is a global organization, but countries do have chapters, and it's a great way for you to network with other like-minded individuals, not just in Canada, Canada, but around the world, because the space industry is global. Yes, there are certain things like uh, national security or activities that you can only do in Canada or the US, but other aspects, the commercial sites, NanoRacks, SpaceX, um, other organizations, those are those transcend boundaries and, and that's global. So I would recommend your first place to look would be Space Generation Advisory Council. Okay. okay. And they have a lot of great activities. Another one I like is um, the International Space University. So if you join SGAC and you say, I really like this, um, International Space University uh, does programming around the world. So I participated in one of their executive forums here for uh, the Americas, they call it. So that would be Canada too, so in the Americas. Uh, and that included South America, so it's all of us. Um, this month, they're going to start a five-week program in Australia. Australia has a huge burgeoning space industry. They're going to do, they do a program in the spring where it's going to be um, uh, Granada. So, and again, we hope COVID that those activities will happen. The one for Australia is going to be virtual. So I share with you that if, if you join Space Generation Advisory Council, that might be a great start. And then the International Space University, ISU, also has connections and opportunities. Um, they do cafe chats where they have great guest speakers that come um, and participate. So again, I, I think getting on getting online with Space Symposium 365, Space Generation Advisory Council, uh, even Women Tech Network. Women Tech Network is open to men and women, and they have a lot of great speakers as well. And the great thing about Women Tech Network is it's in all the technology areas. Space is one segment, but again, space transcends it. So again, if you're looking for that mentor or role model, find somebody with with the skill set you want to develop while you're at the university and then figure out how do you apply that into the space sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Shelly. We have one question from Kisenge in the chat. Okay, uh, so Kisenge is asking, what inspired you to delve into the space field and what keeps you excited about it? <laughs> well, that's great. Well, obviously, initially I was in the military and so that helped direct me into this uh, career when I became an officer in the Air Force. So obviously that is always an opportunity to go into the Canadian military. Uh, obviously we have NORAD here in Colorado Springs, so you could be a Canadian officer and come here to Colorado Springs and get to hang out with me in person. So that is one career path, but the other, but the other way is when I did retire from the military, I saw all the opportunities where space has gone from a few countries you had to be working for a government agency to, we call it democratization of space. And the silos of countries are much less and the opportunities to work globally. So that is the part that is so exciting. And it's exciting to meet young people like yourself. I love uh, mentoring and talking at events and hearing your passion because you're the future of not only the industry, but of the world. So whether it's going to be, um, I, I also mentor for uh, a, a global policy uh, a think tank. And so again, thinking about, do you even want to go into policy? Because the right policies create the right opportunities for space and the workforce. So I hope that, so I'm just a passionate person and, and I love what I do. And I hope that you will find your way into the space community. Okay, amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Shelly. And to anyone who wishes to network with Shelly, by the way, we have her LinkedIn in the chat. Okay, I'm certain Shelly will be very happy to help you along the way. We have one question from Wendy in the chat. Okay, so Wendy is asking, uh, what are some important skill sets that you would recommend students to develop during university? Ah. Excellent. I did yeah. type in their 21st century yeah. skills because the skills you're learning are great, but the world we live in, um, we have to all work together now. We collaborate in teams. When you go work at a company, you're on a team. So the first skill set, communication. 
How do we communicate with one another? And again, communication has changed dramatically during COVID where we all wanted to go to conferences in person and network at the water cooler or in the hallway or exchange business cards. Now we say, please join me on LinkedIn. Uh, I posted that in the chat. Shelly Brunswick, join me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. I have a professional development site on LinkedIn. Um, so we're communicating differently now and that's gonna continue as uh, telework, telecommunication continues. We're gonna we're gonna telecommute uh, communicate with our doctors in the future. That has gone on during COVID. That is gonna continue. So communication skills, leadership skills. Not only being the leader, but are you a good follower? Are you a good team player? So because we're all gonna work on a team, and sometimes you're gonna be the subject matter expert on the team, and sometimes you're gonna be the team leader. So always learning leadership skills. Um, I would also look at, you know, how do you um, create your resume, right? How many of you, you know, so in a real world, I could see you and I'd say, everybody raise your hand who's already started to develop your resume. So I don't know, Matthew, you're the only one I can see. Have you started developing your resume? Yep. All right. So <laughs> say another thing you need to do right now is start developing your resume. Even high school students, I, I tell everybody, because if you want to get a great internship, if you want to be competitive for research projects, you have to start developing that resume. And you want to highlight on that resume growth. So you can try different things. This is this is college. This is when you try photography class and hiking and you know you can try a lot of different things. But also when you start finding something you're passionate about, start building your skill set so you show development. And it could be in sports. So let's say you you play soccer and initially you're the player, but then the next year you're a co-captain. And the year after that, you're a captain, but also a coach. Show how you can develop your skill set in one area and, and show that leadership. So I, I always say develop a resume even to high school students because High school students reach out all the time and say, I want to find an intern program. What do I need to do? Well, the first thing any company is going to ask for is a resume. Um, I hope that was a little bit. I could go on and on, but those 21st century skills are critical as well. No, that's awesome, Shelley. And if I could add something, uh, one little piece of thing that I read in books that I heard from my manager and so many people is that you need to keep your skill set marketable, okay? In the economic crisis, so many senior managers, senior directors, they were fired. And because they did not keep their skill sets marketable, okay, they were not rehired. They, they found it so hard to be able to find another job. So it's just to stress how important that is. I absolutely agree. Even in a job, have a current resume. So I keep my resume current too, not that I'm looking for a new job because I love what I do. But anytime, uh, like when Elaine reached out to me, will you be a speaker at this event, can you send us a resume or can you send us some clips of previous articles or um, conferences you've done? I have that all listed in one place. I don't have to spend a lot of time doing it. Each time I do something, I just add that five minutes. So I keep that current. So when the next opportunity comes up and somebody says, can you send me a short bio and a few um, examples of your speaking or writing skills, I have it ready. So it's just something that you keep ready because you may get an opportunity from a professor that says, I'm do you want to work with me this summer on a project? Give me your resume. If you kind of have something ready to go, you're ready to go. And, and like you said, Matthew, it's always good to keep your skills up sharp. Uh, look for new opportunities to keep the skills sharp. Technology is changing so quickly. So I, I have an MBA. I have my project management professional. But last month I got my... Um, Agile Scrum Master Certification. So um, I took the executive um, space course by International Space University in November. So we all need to be lifelong learners because technology and the world is changing so quickly. So even when you get done with school, I know you're probably going, no, but you're going to continue to watch webinars and participate in activities where you'll continue to stay sharp and current with your career. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Shelley. We have one question from Julien in the chat. He's asking, what is that one piece of advice that you wish you had gotten before entering the space community? Well, I really had no idea what the space community was. Again, this was, for me, it was this homogenized 
uh, military organization. And, but now, as I look at young individuals like yourself and I interact with individuals part of Space Generation Advisory Council, um, I would say network. Um, some people say create your tribe, you know, create your group, network, build relationships now while you're in the university, because those are going to be relationships you're going to continue throughout your life. And, and I have uh, friends from high school I still keep in touch with, friends that I went to college with, friends that I was a second lieutenant with, and now they're general officers in the U.S. Space Force. So build those relationships, build those connections and maintain them. Some people meet people and then they never follow up, but it's about following up too. So go to an event, it, it, even virtually, <laughs> meet one person. You don't have to meet, I, I see there's like 206 people in the, that came to the conference. You don't have to meet all 206. Meet one or two and then have a Zoom coffee with them and build a relationship and maintain the relationship because your career and your future is really gonna be about relationships. Here's one piece of advice. You're not gonna probably get your job off a job board. Maybe, highly unlikely. You're gonna get your job because you interned and met somebody or somebody knows somebody who's looking for somebody and that is probably how you're gonna find your, your job, especially the higher up you go in the space community, the more it's really about your relationships. Okay, amazing. And just one small thing to add on to that. Um, Sometimes students, especially in first or second year, you know, uh, we are a little bit intimidated to reach out, uh, especially if that person has, you know, huge qualifications or a title, like, I don't know, senior manager, senior director of something, okay? But one advice that I could tell the students here is don't be afraid, okay? If the worst thing that could happen is that they say no, and if that's the case, just move on, okay? But if someone says that you have a passion, you have a passion for something and you really want to learn more, okay, usually, they will be more than willing to give you 15, 20 minutes of their time, okay? To have a small coffee chat, have a video call or something, okay? Absolutely. I call those informational interviews. So that, that's different than a mentor or a coach. So informational interviews are, you're interested in coming into the space sector and you wanna to talk to somebody who um, does, let's say, marketing in the space industry. I want to talk to somebody who does marketing. I know, you know, Blue Origin has a marketing person, SpaceX. How do I train to go into marketing? You could probably look on LinkedIn, find some marketing people. And LinkedIn has been a great equalizer. So, you know, before LinkedIn, how did we reach each other? You know, you had, again, know somebody who knew somebody. But now I have people reach out all the time on LinkedIn, connect on LinkedIn. And again, that's why I started a LinkedIn group called Shelly Brunswick's Professional Development. And on there, I post a lot of great information. So go there. Uh, but I have people reach out. And I am usually very happy to give 15 minutes to give somebody the look at it, Space Generation Advisory Council or join Women Tech Network or look for organizations that um, support where your passion is and then start to connect and build those relationships. Um, so I think LinkedIn has created a great equalizer where you can reach out to people. And then the other thing, so that's informational interviews and you should always have those. You should, the, you're in a part of your life where you should be learning and absorbing as much as you can from industry experts so you can help navigate what your journey is going to take you. Then you have mentorship and mentorship or coaching is where somebody really guides you. So for the last year, I have really worked primarily with entrepreneurs um, that are wanting to come into the space sector, develop a product and bring it to market. So that's more of a, a process that takes more time building that relationship and, and to a certain point. And mentors and coaching is not necessarily a lifelong thing. You know, I'm helping somebody at this point in their business and we'll maintain the relationship, but at a certain point, that individual will probably need to find another mentor or coach to help get their product to market. So again, mentoring can transition over time and you can have multiple mentors. Maybe you have a mentor in soccer and you have a mentor in mathematics. So you can have different, I call them advisors. Create your own advisory board. And you know, usually I'd recommend if they can make time for one hour per month to meet with you. Now, however you, is that, two 30 minute sessions twice, you know, every other week or whatever, that would be how I'd suggest mentoring. Um, 
And so I, I share that there's some differences. And then as a mentee, also give back. I learn a lot from my mentees. Um, I actually just, I don't consider it mentor mentee. We're just in a discussion because I learn about what they're passionate about and what's exciting. And so that I understand how I can have better conversations with you to make sure that I'm answering your questions. Because most of my mentor mentees are young 20 year olds who want to be entrepreneurs and bring a product to market to help make the world a better place. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Shelley. We have uh, one question from Isham on the chat. Okay, he's asking, how important do you think GPA is for <laughs> in the space industry? So that's a great question. Um, I don't look at it. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, I, I mean, again, I told you, you're anywhere in there, you know, uh, we have m multi-billionaires that dropped out of college, right? And, uh, and again, they probably got lucky, so stay in school. Um, I think maybe it's, it's, a, it, it's a qualifier maybe for some very competitive things you want to apply for initially at this point in your life where you haven't maybe built out that resume. So remember, think about building out that resume, getting those internships, working for those professors on projects. And you may need to have a relatively reasonable GPA for that competition. But as you develop your skill sets, um, and then people are going to ask you questions. So the questions when you do a job interview is not going to be, I had a 4.2 GPA because I had advanced placement classes. I call it the STAR. Situation, task, action, result. What was the situation I was in? What is the task I did? How was that action? What was the result? That, the STAR. That is what employers or professors are going to want to ha have you discuss. So for instance, let's say another company wanted to hire me and they said, we want you to be our chief operating officer. Okay, I'm going to think of a star answer. Was well, the chief operating officer, I realigned uh, our policy and procedures by doing this, this, and this. This is how I did it over this time and it caused this type of efficiency for our organization. So I hope that's a little, so build the resume, and I'll type that, you know, the star answer is what most individuals are going to want. So, yes, your GPA shows a long time, but um, not not everybody, you know, not everybody can have advanced placement. Um, you know, I have uh, individuals in Zimbabwe or Namibia that are university students that are competing for grants on a global level. I cannot compare them and their GPA to somebody in the U.S. who had a different um Opportunity, so that's part of you know being a diversity and inclusion role model and um, leader for Women Tech Network is I looked at not all systems are equal, and so if I want to break down barriers and allow those individuals who have not been part of the space economy, I have to use a different litmus test. And so GPA could be part of the litmus test, but usually I look at what else were they doing, what. What were they capable of doing where they were at in Zimbabwe, um, the Philippines? I had another woman compete for a grant out of Costa Rica. And then how did they spend their time? So if you um, you don't have a scholarship or you have to work to go to school, that's part of your resume. That's part of your star answer. In addition to going to school and maintaining, maybe it's a 2.9 GPA. I work 30 hours a week and in my job, these are my responsibilities, this, this, and this, and this is what my supervisor thinks of my performance. And because of that, I'm able to do, I'm able to be a great multitasker and I could help you on this research project because I can manage my school load with a 2.9 GPA and I can maintain a job where I'm responsible for these things. So again, it's how you tell that story to a potential employer or intern or wherever. So remember, the star is your answer. Shoot for the stars. <laughs> okay, amazing. Okay, so we have one more question from Ellen. Okay, and I think that question is burning the lips of many people in the audience. It is, what are some ways in which software developers can contribute to the space community? <laughs> Well, I, I shared with you a lot of technology and we need software developers and all of those. Um, you know, I have a woman who is developing an app um, in the UK. She's the entrepreneur, 
but she's going to need a software developer to help her develop that app. So the Aperture, whether you want to be working at SpaceX or the Canadian space industry, or you want to help entrepreneurs with an app, and, and again, or is it technology or is it data analytics? Is it So one of the things when I say this, when you think of data analytics, most companies create data analytics for space and that might be a classified uh, technology. And then they create a commercial technology in the gaming sector. So you could think of yourself as in, you could be in the gaming sector and the space industry with the technology you create. So really, Look at the, the slides I shared or, or, you know, if you and Matthew has my slides, you're welcome to post those and share those um, after the chat. Or you can, again, look at that NASA technology transfer office because you can look at the various opportunities and say, as a software engineer, I'm really interested in this communication. And what does that mean? So one of the areas I see is you've seen all the recent hacks that have happened, right? Cybersecurity is a very challenging area. So we're seeing internet, you know, internet constellations now are going to happen. So we may not have it, you know, that might have been my challenge this morning as I still have terrestrial internet access. You know, uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos will hopefully solve that for us one web in the future. But they're also now looking at because of cybersecurity hacks, do we put our data, our cloud in a satellite that's orbiting? Because the only way to now access that satellite is locking onto it from a ground tracking station from Earth. So the only time you can get into that is very controlled and very secured. So again, I, I, what I share with you is the technology and, and where we're going to go from today to the future is really hard for me to tell. Uh, 5G, the Internet of Things, uh, un, unfathomable. Let me put it to you this way. GPS, when the U.S. military created GPS, is created for a military application that became commercialized. Since 1983, that technology has created 1.3 trillion trillion dollars of economic growth. There's no way we could have foreseen that in 1983. So what I share with you is, I think it's somewhere probably in the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, data analytics, 5G is going to unlock tremendous opportunity and your degrees are going to be critical in that area. So what I recommend is look at those various sectors. Where is your passion? Where is your skill set for software engineering? And where is it in that space industry? And look at where that technology merges and creates new opportunities. Okay. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shelley. That's very inspiring. Wonderful. Okay. Awesome. I see that currently we don't have any more questions in the chat. Okay. So I guess we can call it a day, but if anyone has any question, please reach out on the VIP Discord. We have a, cha a channel, uh, especially for Shelly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that, I wish to thank you so much for coming Shelly and for giving us these inspiring words. It's my pleasure, and I'm honored to be here. I want to thank you for putting this wonderful conference together, as well as your sponsors that make this possible. And I really look, you know, and I do look forward to hearing from you, Matthew and Ellen and others. Because I want to hear how your journey's going and where it takes you, because the future of space, uh, the sky is not the limit. So I look forward to seeing you, whether it's here on Earth or on Mars. Okay, amazing. Thank you again, Shelley, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Awesome. All right.